Welcome back to the HS Arena Invitational final day. We're down to our very final pair. Two beers and six, so we'll meet in our final in just uh, a little while. We have our third place match coming up for you now. It's going to be Eloise and Zalay, two very well-known players, players I'm sure you've all heard of and seen before. I'm your host, Calum Leslie, with Sottle on this cast. And uh, this is a really interesting one, Sottle. Zalay, I feel like he's going to be looking for a little bit of retribution after yeah. that semi-final, because he just got absolutely ruffle stomped by six o's face hunter three zero in like less than 15 minutes one of the quickest competitive series i've ever seen and uh Ellie, she just lost three one to one of the open qualifiers so both these players looking to restore a little bit of pride in the third place match yeah definitely anyone anyone that does almost anything competitively puts in a ton of practice like they're generally quite proud people you don't want to you don't want to be in a situation where you get crushed 3-0 like that. So Zale will probably be looking to, to make a comeback as strong as he can here. Um, Eloise herself, uh, not not too spectacular a result against two beers earlier, but she'll be looking for a bit of redemption as well. But third place match is always a nice way for you know the two people who missed out on the, the glory of the final to at least uh, take something home with them, take a bit of prestige. Third place in a major tournament is nothing to sniff at, so both these players will be uh, trying their best to, to pick up the win here. And they'll double their money. The third place winner will take $500, $250 for first place. Uh, and I believe it is 3000 for first place. I'm just checking what it is for the second place. 1250 So, uh, you know, you double your money. That's not insignificant as well. It all adds up when you're a, a pro player playing in lots of tournaments and picking up little, bit, little bits of prize money here and there. Uh, but yeah, it would be a good finish for either of these players to add to their resumes. Looking at the lineups, they're both playing the exact same classes, which is very interesting. The Druid, Hunter, and Warrior, with both banning Paladin. Both banning Paladin, all right. Um, we know that the Warriors are very different, though, obviously. The Warriors that... are very, very different. Um, but I think this might be one of the first series we've seen where we have just had a mirrored Paladin ban, both players respecting the Paladin, getting rid of it entirely. So we're going to have a entirely Paladin-free series here, but as you mentioned, different Warrior builds... Uh, and both slightly different from the normal, if you like, control warrior build that you guys are used to seeing. Uh, Zalay has slowed it down a ton and is, is taking it to the fatigue approach. Lots of life gain, lots of removal, just trying to deal with all of uh, his opponent's threats. Not many proactive cards, just a couple of threats of his own there in the deck. Um, Eloise, on the other hand, has gone with a patron warrior build that is different from the patron warrior build that we've seen from 6-0 as well. Different people have trying to take this in different directions, and she obviously has her own twist on this. So interesting to see uh, how well she's able to do with that going forward. Yeah, I've, we haven't seen the same results from uh, her patron deck as we've seen from 6 I feel like 6 has been a little bit more impressive here, but we haven't really seen a ton of Eloise's. We said that the first two times we saw her in stream, it was banned, and then it did lose to the mid-range hunter of two beers that was uh, had things like Harrison Jones was very strong against Warrior. So hasn't really had a fair hearing yet. Yeah, that's fair. Um, hopefully, for her sake, it makes a decent showing in this series. Um, but just, how do you feel? If you were, if you were Eloise or Zale, whichever one you like, do you have any preference about which class you'd want to be picking first in this situation? Any matchups you want to target specifically? I'm not really sure. It's just so difficult to judge the the patron warrior, for example, and it's also quite difficult to judge the fatigue warrior. Uh, what, in what's your route to victory against the fatigue warrior, Sotel? A route to victory against a fatigue warrior? Yeah, so if yes. you're Eloise looking to pick into it. Yeah, generally you, you want your druid into it as Eloise for sure. That's something that we saw um, do reasonably well, although Zalay was able to take the win. It was it was only small fractions that did it. It was only that the druid player that, that Zalay managed to fatigue out didn't draw into the, the double combo quick enough, didn't get enough mid-range tempo down with threats. Um, that's definitely an option you have with that deck. Just try and get a little bit of chip damage in early with your minions where you can, and then save up, since you're going to see the majority of your deck anyway, save up the big Force of Nature double Savage Raw combo and burst the, the Warrior down that way. So I definitely think Eloise will be trying to line her Druid up against the Fatigue Warrior of Zalay. So I'd expect her to try and protect that a little bit, probably not lead with it, unless she has a really, really strong read that Zalay was going to lead with the Warrior. Well, this is a pretty good matchup for Eloise to pick into. First, the mid-range hunter into the druid. It's one we've talked about uh, quite a bit today that we've seen in the different lineups. It's uh, a very very strongly favored for the, the hunter. Yeah, definitely. Um, early efficient minions like Horned Creeper, Mad Scientist, etc. can just do great work against druid. Um, it's a matchup the druid needs to get very, very specific draws lined up to, to come back in. Uh, whereas the hunter just wants to hit any sort of consistent curve of pressure. 
and just uh, finish it out with a high main. Um, you know, by, by the latest at turn eight or so, you don't necessarily need to hit it right on turn six against Druid, although that would, that would be ideal, but some sort of high main in a, high, in a timely fashion is, is very much appreciated before the game reaches the point where the, the Druid can really take over with like multiple large minions per turn. You could definitely describe both of these hands as potentially a little bit clunky. Uh, we do have a two drop from Eloise that she can go into, and then and a double Eagle Horn Bow is not something you ever want to see. No real early game from Zelay. He can innovate out a keeper here for the silence, but and then he doesn't have a three drop to follow that up. Yeah, he doesn't have a three drop or a four drop really um, to follow up with. Obviously, he has the coin, so he has the potential to do something like innovate, keeper, coin, shredder, but there's no shredder in his hand, so. Uh, accelerating so fast with the Innovate um, might not be worth it just because of how badly you'd have to slow down on the following turn. Uh, Eloise's hand, as you say, it's, it's less than perfect in this situation, but the, the two drop into bow start for mid-range hunter against Druid these days isn't that bad because you get to play your two drop and then uh, if the Darnassus Aspirant comes out in response, you can just bow it down nice and cleanly and move on. Um, but yeah, with no great targets for these bows to swing out, this is a little bit of a clunky draw from Eloise as well. Well, it looks like Zelay's just going to go into the Innervate Coin Druid of the Claw. I mean, I guess when you've got no real follow-up to any ramp play and nothing really to play, you might as well just go all in. Yeah, goes all in on the, the Druid of the Claw. Obviously, hunt, uh, Hunter's Mark would be the devastating punish here, but Kill Command tidies it up quite nicely as well. Uh, pushes through with the Horned Creeper, retains the two 1-1s one on the board, uh, retains a, a slight board advantage, and that was a big, big investment from Zelay that turn to dump that many resources into speeding himself up to his 5-drop. Um, it's just going to be a pretty sad looking hero power pass turn here, but again, switching back to Eloise's side, she doesn't have a great deal to do to follow this up. No big powerful board drop like a shredder to slam on the board. Animal Companion's pretty good though. Yeah, that's not a bad pick up. I mean, that, such a punish there for Zelay, not able to do anything on turn 3 except hero power. Turn 4 again. I don't think there's going to be a great deal of thought put into this turn. This looks like a pretty clean swipe turn, and then suddenly you're in a you're in a nice position where your minions start lining up pretty nicely. You have a, you have an Azure Drake next turn, then you can follow that up with potentially keep a plus Wrath as a removal play, and then suddenly your seven drops come into the game and, and make a huge impact. And you've you've stabilized this game really really effectively, um, with as you said was a pretty clunky hand, but that's primarily because it was matched with equal clunkiness from Eloise's side. Sure, and an example of that clunkiness coming to hand there, the Houndmaster, is just going to be played as a vanilla 4-3. Never feels good. And there's a low fab, good pick up on 5. Okay, that is actually a pretty important draw, because the Azure Drake doesn't seem too exciting to play out here against the uh, the Houndmaster. The low fab much more appealing, that one extra point of health uh, makes all the difference here in terms of dominating the ball, building a platform that you can you can build on for the next turn. And it, it encourages the Houndmaster to ignore the Lower Theb and just go face. You have plenty of health to absorb that four damage at this point. And then you can use the Wrath the following turn when it fits into your curve more nicely with something like Keeper of the Grove. Yeah, so the Lower Theb does come down, as you say. The Houndmaster, good answer maybe for a preemptive Azure Drake. It's not great to play the 4-3 just as a 4-3, but does get something done. We're just going to see trade into the Lothab here. So Lothab getting some work done there. Five to face and taking out the Soundmaster. Yeah, and I think that's Eloise respecting the fact that she hasn't got enough early game tempo going to really be the aggressor in this matchup and start pushing damage to face. She needs to try and uh, play for the board. She knows from her perspective she has Dr. Boom in her hand, so playing for the board seems pretty attractive. Um, but looking over at that huge stack of cards that the Bionic Druid has, you'd be uh, it's pretty reasonable to expect that they have a lot of decent plays as well. And we see that Zelay has his own Doctor Boom anyway. Yep, yeah, the seven drops are going to start coming out here. There's a Savannah Hymen as well, which we have seen some players favor the, boom, the Hymen over the Boom when both have been green. It's one of the few cards that can take priority over a Doctor Boom <laughs> yeah, in kind of a re sure. regular gameplay. Ancient of Lore being one of the only other ones. Yeah, but you know, strong play from Eloise last turn to switch the initiative, uh, or switch the focus of the game back to board development. Because um, she was going to be the first one to develop the Dr. Boom, even if Zelay did have it, which we see that he does. And Dr. Boom, in response to Dr. Boom, I mean, it always feels reasonable if you're in a stable position, but it's not spectacular. He'd much rather have a, a clean removal for this, like a big game hunter, and then be able to develop something alongside that. But uh, not too many options for dealing with this right now. He can go with Wrath and Keeper for five and trade his own Keeper. To take the 7-7 off the board would leave a keeper in play against the two boom bots and the weapon. 
And that's one possible line. And the other line is just to um, really try and stamp your authority on this game and say that actually you're the one that's ahead right now. You've gained the initiative in the early game and just try and play your own Dr. Boom and see if you can get away with that. Um, but it is scary against uh, some things like Hunter's Mark. Yeah, I like playing Boom into Boom because, as you say, it is a more aggressive play. It obviously directly answers the Dr. Boom from your opponent almost just because it's the same thing. Yep. So that's a, pr a pretty good direct answer. But we see there are other threats in the hand for Eloise, like Savannah Hymane and Lothab. Lothab could come down with an Ego Horn bow if, he decide, if she decides to use the bow charge this turn, but I wouldn't necessarily be against a uh, Savannah Hymane slam hero power. You're not in combo turn, so is Savage Roar... Savage Roar isn't lethal, right? So... Uh, Savage Roar would add 10, you'd have 11, so 21. Savage Roar would be lethal exactly. if you deal okay, with so. absolutely nothing, but yeah. I don't see that's ever going to happen. Um, but honestly, I think you can just play for Ward again here as Eloise if you really want to. Um, she can choose to trade and just redevelop high main, be dominant on the board again if she wants to go that way. Um, but at some point, she's going to have to make the push to be aggressive because you can't hope to play just card for card, threat for threat, for druid for forever. Because they are going to outvalue in, in that game eventually. Um, she's had a pretty nice draw where she's drawn into three of her highest value minions, lower third, uh, high main, and Doctor Boom. But Druid just has a much bigger density of those sorts of threats in, in their deck. So I like if you under the wolf there because you can lock out combo if combo was an option. Sure. So if Eloise, did, if uh, Zalei did something like Keeper of the Dome and Hero Power, Keeper of the Dome. Keeper of the, the Dome. <laughs> Keeper of the Grove to the face and hero power, something like that, just to push in that extra damage and set up for a combo, Eloise could just slam Lothab and lock it out. Sure. Um, I... Keeper of the Dome, that's a good one. Yeah, F F file that one, Callum. We'll use that one later. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't mind starting this turn with the Azia Drake, uh, seeing what you draw into, making your decision from there. Um, your opponent mm. has shown that she is looking to, to value the, the ball position first and foremost. Um, so if you can get that Drake into play and it sticks, you can use that to put four damage on the high main, and then you have Keeper to silence it, and then Wrath for one to cycle and kill it off completely uh, to deal with it on the following turn. Uh, I wouldn't even hate innovating out the second Drake now that that's your draw. That's exactly what Zalei is going to do. And so two Drakes on the board, pretty intimidating board, and now we do see the Savage Roar in hand, so he's starting to put together some sort of serious threat of lethal, and... The, the second Azure Drake is a really good pickup because now you kind of do force your opponent to make the trade that you really want them to because it sets up an insane turn for you on the follow-up with Keeper of the Grove and Wrath. Yeah, asking the high main to not go to face. I mean, you guys talked about the high main rule earlier, which uh, I have to say, Amaz has kind of rescinded the high main rule a little okay. bit. And I think the last time I heard the high main rule has to be if it hits face on an empty board. Ah, okay. Was the last version I heard him explaining away how he lost a game where he hit face with high main. Yep, so the Lothab is going to come down, and that puts an end to uh, Zalei's set up here for the, the Keeper of the Grove plus Wrath. That now, unfortunately, costs 11 mana. So we're not going to be tying those two cards together, but he is getting very, very close to a push for lethal. His opponent has... Uh, Eloise, she's 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 managed to take the board pretty convincingly this game, but it's almost been a role reversal where the, the Druid has uh, been aggressive early, got off to the, the slightly quicker start, and the Hunter's been forced to play for board the whole time, has outvalued the Druid, but the Druid is just uh, forcing the race situation and threatening to kill the Hunter over the top. Right now at 28 health, he's looking at 15, 17 damage from his opponent, including the hero power. So he could just choose to, to go all in here. He has uh, Druid of the Claw Savage Roar for Burst on the following turn. Definitely an option. Yeah, it would have to be like double kill command quick shot or double kill command Eel Horn Ball yeah, to, have to finish you off. Some ridiculous combination of cards. And you already saw one kill command used early on the game on your innovated uh, Druid right. of the Claw. Um, but it looks like we are going to see the Silence play. And is this guy charging? Yeah, cat form. Awesome. I like it. Yeah, no, I like this as well. You can pick up things like Swipe and maybe even another... You, we've already played one Druid of the Claw, but you can pick up other minions, establish this board, hit Savage Roar, and lots of options for lethal here. Yeah, he has the Wild Growth to dig next turn as well. He has the Wrath to dig next turn if he wants to. Um, 
Really, really would have loved to be able to use the Wrath that turn, though, because this 6-1 high main is able to just pick up any value he likes, trading into one of the 4-4s, four um, which drastically reduces uh, Zalay's threat for the following turns. He's, he's fully accepting the fact he's not going to have a board left next turn. The trades here are just too obvious, too clean to turn down, especially when you're this low on life. Uh, so he needs to put together something that threatens to... Uh, Kill Eloise from an empty board and kill her quickly because that second high main being drawn is now puts this on a very, very quick clock against the opponent, even from 28 life. I think it's swipe for lethal, right? Swipe will do it, yeah. Swipe, savage draw, hero power. So you can dig twice, you can dig once for the swipe. Well, no, you can't even do that because no, you, you can't. can't hero power. You need nine mana to have mm. lethal with swipe here, so. So I think you probably just developed the Druid of the Claw and Wild Growth the, to, wait, di to, to cycle as well and try and dig for it for next turn. Right. So you know there's not going to be any healing in your opponent's deck, so you might as well. Darnassus, that's a little bit late. Absolutely. And so he has two options here. He can use the Wrath to take five power off the board, uh, which may increase his clock and give him another turn. And so he naturally draws more cards throughout the game. The other option was just to cycle that Wrath immediately and try and dig directly for the Force of Nature to end the game next turn. Uh, Zalei chooses to go for the removal option, give himself the maximum number of turns. Uh, but now Misha creates a bit of an issue for potential lethals. It's an interesting question for Eloise as well. Is what do you do with this 5-5? Five -five? You have to trade with the high man, right? Uh, well, do you set up lethal by going face? You go to put, put him to 15. Uh, the 4-4 four four will definitely disappear next turn. So you then have 8, 11, 13. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very fragile that you're going to set up lethal the following turn. So I think you have to just continue to play safe and uh, accept that you're still on a two-turn clock here. And yeah, Eloise seems to have come to the same conclusion. She is going to trade just... Uh, Try and activate this two-turn clock. So there is the force of nature, and that is still going to be lethal, because one tree with the Savage Roar will uh, trade with Misha, and the, the other two plus the face, plenty of damage to push through. Don't even need all the trees. Don't even need the face. Just do it with the, the two trees alone. Boom. Of course, when I said Druid of the Claw to draw cards, I did mean Ancient of Lore, because that was the card that was in the hand. And is the card that draws cards. Of course. That is what I meant. We, we went with you on that one, Callum. There's no sure. need to clarify. Yeah. We knew what you were talking about. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Just getting some abuse on Twitter. Not even Twitch chat. I'm not even looking at Twitch chat. <laughs> the, the tweets were flying in, uh, correcting me on that one. But yes, uh, strong performance there. Interesting the way that game worked out. But as you say, it was kind of the other way around from that matchup normally, right? The <laughs> Hunter was establishing the board presence. The Druid was really struggling to fight back on the board. And Zalei just realized he needed to go aggressive dig for the the options to end the game and eventually did get the force of nature yeah it was a slightly strange way for the matchup to play out that is something that the druid has to do at some point at some point they have to start playing aggressive and really push the initiative back on the opponent um because the the if you if you wait around for too long just making defensive plays all the time hunter will just happily like keep seizing the tempo every turn and has the inevitability of the hero power to to rush you down eventually um, but that was just a, a really strange role reversal where the, the Druid just got off to a much quicker start and uh, Eloise was playing catch up the whole time trying to make the consolidated board trades and Zalei was just able to find the burst to, to push through over the top once he definitively lost the board at the end. Well, we're going to see a Druid mirror here, which uh, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if, I would, if I'm Eloise, if I don't, I, I think I would go for this because I personally wouldn't be confident that the kind of mid-range patron warrior can really outvalue the mid-range druid. I think the mid-range druid just kind of wins that battle for me. Uh, it's an interesting question because all the cards that were effective for patron warrior against druids before are still in the deck, right? You still have that opportunity to generate patrons early in the matchup and take it away from them that way. And when you add things like piloted shredder to the deck, you're able to, to you know, kind of match them for tempo. But like I say, I'm not particularly familiar with Eloise's build. We haven't seen a great deal of it. So I don't know exactly what her patron build is and how it lines up. Um, so it might just be like a, it might be more similar to Control Warrior, just with some Grim Patrons in there. In which case, I can understand why she would view uh, Druid as a poor matchup. Yep. So the mirror match here does get the Coin Wild Growth Shade start, which always feels pretty good when I get that on Ladder Subtle. That's uh, definitely a strong line of play. It is for sure. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility going on in this hand with uh, the Aspirant as well. 
Um, she has the option to coin the Aspirant, and then she has the backup plan of the Wild Growth to fall back on. But as you said, coin Wild Growth into Shade is the consistent option. Uh, the problem that does give you is that if your opponent then plays Darnassus Aspirant, you're kind of forced to wrath it. Um, well, not forced, but you know you have a difficult decision about whether you want to wrath it or not. So it looks like she is going to go for the board development play with the Darnassus Aspirant first and put uh, Zelay in that tricky situation instead and say, you know, do you want to develop your board or do you want to wrath this Aspirant? So he does go with the answer, which you can't blame him really for when to get this Darnassus off. Potentially if your opponent's looking at 3-drop into 4-drop and can just run away with the board. Yeah, so now she has the Wild Growth to fall back on, but the, the downside of doing it this way is that she doesn't get a perfect curve, because now she's going to be playing a 3-drop on her 4-mana turn. She is still playing a 3-drop on turn 3, which is obviously totally fine, but not, not <laughs> the potential of what you can be doing against Druid. Or as she picks up a Shredder or something. Oh, there um, you go. Well, I mean, that worked out really nicely then, didn't it? Did I just say the word Shredder as the Shredder came into the hand? I think I did. Yep. Um, so yeah, I guess we're, we're jamming that Shredder. I think I like the Shredder over the uh, Wrath Hero Power. And she's probably considering the merits of um, you know Druid of the Claw coming down this turn to protect that Aspirant, but she still has the Wrath plus Shade play next turn with 5 mana that she can use to take out whichever target she values higher. She can just Wrath down the the Aspirant cleanly, or she can Wrath into the Druid of the Claw, or trade into that with the Shredder, if the Druid of the Claw turn was to happen. So I definitely like yeah. developing the Shredder here. Yeah, only a Lothab hmm. prevents the Darnassus from dying the next turn. Right. So yeah, I, I don't mind really leaving it alone. And Azure Drake into a Pilot Shredder does not feel ideal. And this is a big power spike turn for Eloise here. Gets the Shade down, Wrath to take out the 2-3. Clean trade into the uh, Azure Drake. If she even chooses to take it, but I'm sure she will because it's an Azure Drake. So Azure Drake is scary to, to buff up things like Wrath and Swipe for Druid. Makes makes their slightly lackluster removal slightly more scary as the opponent. Hmm. Of course, correct ordering is to uh, trade first, right? Just in case you get the Doomsayer. Yeah, I mean, no Mana Wraith trash. does mess up your turn as well. Oh, this is true. So, I'm never, never bar that one. Not on Shade. Interesting. Uh, the the you know the one specific minion thing out of Shredder has got so unlikely these days, um, with the the new set of two drops being added to it with the TGT expansion. I think it's something like eighty three or eighty four possible drops from a Shredder now. Um, the 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 Doomsayer concern is lessened, but obviously if there's no drawback of doing it the other way, there's no harm in playing around it. But there's there's always the Mana Wraith uh, option as well that's going to screw you up on some turns almost just as badly. It's very true. Rock in a hard place, I guess, whether or not you decide to go for it. Yep. So, killing their Donassus denies the Thoris in this turn. There is a Shredder, as well as the Keeper of the Grove. I don't think I like the Shredder just because the hero power and the blue gill take care of it. I kind of... I, I like using the Keeper to kill the blue gill here, I think. What to do? Yeah, this is a tough turn. Um... Five drops, generally something that Druid does okay with, although some have been rotated out of this build of the deck to make room for things like Darnassus Aspirant since the TGT expansion. But normally five is a turn you feel pretty comfortable in, in hitting a big power play on, but there's nothing really spectacular for Zelay to do here. I don't know, I think I just favor developing the Shredder here. It's, it's the biggest thing you can do. Um... It's it's kind of unlikely that you're punished by hero power and precisely the second shredder from your opponent since you've already seen one used. Uh, so if you if if Eloise does choose to hero power here, then um, it's, it's at least going to slow her down. So yeah, I like the development of the shredder, but again, Eloise is just drawing such a fantastic curve off the top of her deck. She got the shredder on turn four. She got the emperor on turn six. So she's really filling in those little gap turns that she really needs, and now she's. Uh, Managed to push through all the way to her uh, her seven drops, which now get discounted as well. I was going to say, ironically, the seven drops no longer <laughs> yeah. perfect seven mana minions. Yeah. Because you uh, have them down to six. Which do you prefer, the Ancient of Lore or the Ancient of War from Eloise? Um, I mean, it's tough to say without seeing what board state she's going to be playing into next turn. Um, but uh, normally I like to go for the lore first if I'm reasonably ahead. Um, the, the more, much more defensive play, the kind of thing you'd make if you're behind and you want to try and pick up a couple of trades on the board, force your opponent to trade in multiple minions. But generally on a board like this that's relatively level or ahead, I kind of like the Ancient of Lore. just gives you the, the maximum amount of options over the course of the game, gives you multiple options for next turn. 
Yeah, I tend to agree. I think, especially when you were sitting on three cards there, obviously four with the draw. But you can bring yourself up to five cards as well, which uh, answers the five cards of your opponent. Just staying level there, making sure you're not getting outvalued or running out of resources at all. But you do have things like Druid of the Claw and Ancient of War as well, so you've got good answers in your hand. Yeah. Um, the Taunt Minions here, both Ancient of War and Druid of the Claw, do have some merit in protecting the Shade. You could play a big Taunt Minion and go go face with the Shade, actually reveal it. That would be a lot more appealing if the Shade had one more health and wasn't vulnerable to, to Wrath, though. If you Forcing your opponent to, to swipe the Shade is probably fine, uh, but I don't think you want to reveal it right now with, with three health and protect it behind a Taunt. But uh, it looks like Eloise is favouring that sort of play, so I would imagine she's going to go for the attack here with the Shade. No, she's going to keep the value out of it. Interesting. Yeah, interesting to go with the the taunt and the keeping the shade stealth there, not trading with the shredder, or even go just going face and trying to set up for a, a savage war draw in a couple of turns to set up lethal. Yeah, seven is... drop picked up for Zalay as well with the ancient of lore. There is definitely some merit here to um, if your opponent has a keeper in the hand, you kind of force it out this turn, uh, or you at least uh, tempt them very heavily into using it this turn, and you're shutting down one of the big druid power turns, which as we saw from Eloise, she had multiple cards that are by default seven mana in her hand that have really powerful effects so your opposing druid is going to have the same thing they have their laws potentially wars and dr boom as well so seven is a big power spike turn for druid so making them do a, a kind of utility turn where you have to silence uh, a 510 deal with the board that's in front of you is there's a lot of merit to that and the 510 obviously a lot more threatening immediately than the 55 and it is going to be the keeper coming down so skipping the turn in terms of the bombs coming down from the lake. Yep. Um, but, you know, even the, the 510 getting silenced, leaving behind the 55, in terms of tempo, that's what she would have generated with the other play anyway, if she would have played the Ancient of Law. Um, and it wouldn't have required the four mana investment to silence first. So she actually would have fallen further behind on the board playing the 55. So I can understand why she did what she did, but I still think I, I, I favor doing these, these two plays in the opposite order and just getting yourself uh, more options for the following turn. Deving Roots, uh, not quite good enough here to, to seize back this board, but might be useful in the coming turns. Yeah, it's. I'm not sure it's going to see play. I'm not really sure where she's going to be able to find uh, a use for that. But things like Druid of the Claw are going to come down, of course, Force of Nature sitting in the hand waiting for a Savage Roar. Um, she'll be disappointed she can't play the Shade this turn as well and develop that and get two shades down and really threaten potential lethal lethal with a savage roar looks like she's considering playing the uh, oh, living rates as tokens here which is has to be the only consideration over a hero power this turn um, and looks like uh, some trading is going to begin now and the shade finally comes out of hiding and looks like yeah these living roots are going to come down as tokens here just for a bit of extra board presence yep a little bit weak to swipe which we see is in the far left of Zalay's hand but don't blame her. I mean, it's, as I say, it's not a very high value card at this point, especially in this matchup. And because there are th the hero power, the swipe, lots of options to clear them. Yeah, and still, swipe isn't perfect. You still still have a couple of awkward numbers. You know, five and two means that both of those are one out of range of the damage that swipe's going to do. You can only hero power one of them, so that means your minion has to go into the other if you want to get the full clear. Um, so swipe still isn't perfect. I definitely don't blame her for, for generating them on the board here. Um, but yeah, this is a scary position for Zalay to be in, so I think we will see the swipe come down this turn, but he's he's really looking for a way to play this turn that doesn't involve using swipe, because swipe basically locks him out of any development this yeah. turn whatsoever. He can't play any of his minions, he can just swipe in hero power. Yeah. It's just super defensive, and gives, uh, gives Eloise a really good chance to establish a board of her own on the opposite turn, and when you're sitting at 18 health, any kind of minion sit that sits on the board for more than a turn is a real threat. Yeah, for sure. And there's a potential uh, Savage Raw turn, but that doesn't do much more. And yeah, this is the other option that I wanted to talk about, where you, you just play Lurtheb, which saves you from the combo of you. you're going into turn 9. So you can't die this turn. You get a 5-5 five -five against a 5-5, five -five, so it's only that extra 1-1 one -one on the board that you're behind, uh, plus whatever your opponent plays this turn. Um, and you might even put yourself in a position where you can use your combo to clear on the following turn and try and outvalue your opponent on the board with the two really high value cards that you have left after that, the Ancient of Law and the Emperor Thorasan. All right, Eloise setting up for next turn lethal. Is there any such luck for Zalay? I don't think so. <sighs> um, I mean, he can clear everything that he can interact with um, using his combo pieces. 
but the shade is still going to be on board. It's going to grow to three, and there's going to be at me. It's going to be exactly twelve from Eloise using the innovate. Uh, Force of Nature for six, Keeper to the face for two, uh, three from the shade, and then Innovate Hero Power. Would you in fact call it Keeper of the Dome? <laughs> you keep milking that one for a while yet, Kelly. Why not? I'm going to pretend I meant it. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the best way to do it, right? Just look make it, confident. Make it. Yeah, look confident, pretend that's what you meant the whole time. So yeah, um, as expected, this looked like the line that Zalei was approaching when he decided to go with the lower step play using the Force of Nature Savage Raw combo to clear the board and hoping that he can stabilize and outvalue uh, with his hand, which is three pretty strong cards plus the Shredder that he drew this turn. Um, unfortunately though, as long as I've counted correctly the turn before, this is just going to be lethal. I mean, definitely with Swipe. I think... Uh... Yeah, Swipe definitely helps. Yep, exactly, so even without the hero power. Uses the swipe just for a bit of tilt factor, why not? Alright, so Eloise is going to level this series up one to one. Hunter of Eloise and the Druid of Zalei are now eliminated. So Hunter and Warrior versus Druid and Warrior. It's going to be Eloise's Druid coming up. Obviously, the you, you talked about the Fatigue Warrior being uh, a decent matchup for the Druid or as... Good it, matchup it's as you strong can get. The, it's strong for the druid, yeah. Yeah, it's it's probably the best matchup. So Zalei is probably going to avoid that and go into the hunter, which is a strong mid range hunter. And again, that's a good matchup for the hunter. So feels like we're going very back and forth here in the matchups. Yeah, we are. Um, there is the fact that you know Zalei's had success in this very tournament with Fatigue Warrior against Druid, so it might be a matchup that he feels comfortable in. But I would, yeah, I was going to say I would be surprised to not see the mid range hunter come out here because. In theory, it is extremely powerful, though. Even in this exact series, we've seen it lose. Um, in theory, it, it should be able to, to spiral the board out of control. And this is a, a much quicker start with the Web Spinner and the Hunter's Mark. Double Web Spinner is, is fast, but it's a bit low power. Uh, he would have preferred to see uh, things like Knife Juggler, Horny Creeper, Mad Scientist, uh, Animal Companion in his hand instead of that second Web Spinner. Uh. Well, I mean, turn one sorted, and then turn six onwards, we're fine. It's just that nasty gap in the middle that we're going to have. Yeah, a that, that, that pesky little gap from turns two through five. Yeah. Well, you can say you could you could coin the Savannah on five, but then you have a problem on six, so. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned before, uh, Innovate and Keeper of the Grove, two of the most important cards you're looking for as a Druid if you are going to swing this match up your way. And uh, yeah, Bloodfen Raptor, pretty good target for Keeper of the Grove if uh, Eloise decides she wants to use Innovate as a coin this turn, but that's definitely not necessary. She can just develop the shade if she wants and then continue to curve through naturally with the Keeper of the Grove next turn. I don't know what you were saying, but Eloise curve, he got a perfect two drop there, Bloodfen Raptor. Yep, I mean, trust your web spinners, right? They, they'll just fill the gaps for you. I'm not sure he's going to get as lucky with the second one. Obviously, he's not even played the second one yet. So no, what is he going to do on turn this three? This is fine. On turn three, he's going to play Web Spinner Hero Power, and then the Web Spinner's going to die, and it's going to give him Savage Combatant for turn four. Oh, okay, cool. 100% of the time. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, Are there any so other four-drop beats beasts he could want? Oasis Snapjaw, I guess. Oasis uh, Armored Warhorse. Now, let's test our Web Spinner knowledge. Let's keep, <laughs> it's like, you know, to keep naming them until one of us runs out. Playing the Jefferino round, right? You yeah. just have to keep naming one each until you run out. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm I'm cutting it there because I can't think of okay. it. Okay. Keep of the Grove. Good answer to the knife juggler. For sure. And yeah, holding on to it is going to get rewarded because he's going to she sorry is going to snipe down a higher value target with the knife juggler and the bloodfen raptor. So. That is uh, okay. It's hard enough to remember the correct pronouns to when you're casting and concentrating on the game. It is harder given our view. We can't actually see the players' faces. So. It's cause a break. <laughs> I'm defending you there, Saul. It's fine, yeah. Something you've never done for me when I've when I've made mistakes. Wow, you know. come on, Calvin. <laughs> I stick off you all the time. <laughs> keeper to the dome. Keeper of the dome. It's uh, not going to be a keeper of the dome. It's not. Unfortunately, this this keeper is a hundred percent of the time. If it's played, it's a hundred percent of the time interaction oh, no. with that knife juggler. Um, but looks like Eloise might be considering. Uh, some sort of innovate play, getting out the Sylvanas, but Keeper just looks way too juicy here. Just when anytime you can get rid of a knife juggler with a Keeper, yeah. on curve, it feels pretty great. Point. Actually, gonna yeah, innovate into the wild. Sorry, yeah, innovates the wild growth um, to give herself the option of the Sylvanas on the following turn, more than likely. Uh, just maximum flexibility. She can basically play any card she draws with that much mana alongside an innovate. 
Um, so just giving ourselves the maximum options for next turn. Yeah, when you've got that much ramp in your hand, you do kind of need to get it out at some point. There's no use waiting for a convenient opportunity. Sure. It's not giving her a perfect turn. It's not like she's ramping specifically into Sylvanas when she doesn't have any other option or ramping specifically into a 7-drop. But it just, as you say, gives her flexibility and means she gets the wild growth out at some point, which it's pretty important to actually play wild growth for wild growth to be beneficial. Sure. Um, so I like starting this turn with trading the web spinner. If you do pick up a high value play that you're kind of lacking at the moment, then sure, we can just go ahead and do that. Uh, if you don't, then you can just do the double trade into the keeper and isolate the shade of Naxxramas. With that is not terrible. It does involve using the coin, which is a pretty good card in your hand when you're still missing anything to do until a six mana high main. Um, so yeah, it looks like we're going to continue favoring the initial plan, which was freezing trap and try and isolate that shade of Naxxramas. Yeah, there we go. Trade from the Bloodfriend Raptor. As you say, isolates the shade where it has to enter the freezing trap if she wants to attack with it. Picks up another wild growth. I guess, I mean, it feels a little bit better that she now played the wild growth the previous turn, otherwise she'd be sitting on two wild growths. But... Right. Um, but yeah, I, I like this plan. So you, you trade down the board and you essentially uh, put a trap into play that has a chance of, quote, killing the shade of Naxxramas, at least removing it from the board, making it extremely clunky in the hand. And then you can start to dominate the board afterwards with the coin high main. Uh, of course, there was the option to coin King of Beasts. It would have got value, but then that slows down the rest of your hand so much if you use the coin when you have Boom and uh, High Main in your hand. And now the Sylvanas kind of uh, ruins the High Main plan just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the Hunter's Mark isn't the hand, so Hunter's Mark and Unleash is a, a pretty easy clear on this Sylvanas if you order it correctly and don't get one to give Eloise a free dog. I wonder. But that's not a great turn five. You can hero power, and obviously weaving in the hero power is, is beneficial. But you've also just picked up a sludge belcher. It's not even like you were sitting on a we something weird like a king of beasts or no five drop, uh, and then can just hold the savannah hymen for turn six. You have just drawn a really good five drop. Yeah, I think sludge belcher and king of beasts both have their arguments here. Obviously, neither of them is perfect against the Sylvanas, but you just don't really have a good play against the Sylvanas. So you can abandon the idea of looking for some sort of magical perfect play here altogether. Um, the Unleash the Hounds Hunter's Mark plan is definitely an idea, um, but I don't mind just developing one either one of the, the five drop taunt guys here. All right, so they has to decide pretty quickly. He's yeah. going to go for the sludge belcher. Long time thinking about that. Of course, uh, the first part of the Belcher does just die to the shade if Eloise decides to reveal it. Well, the Freezing Trap is in play, so sure. the shade is, is going to be the, the target that has to get frozen if Eloise wants to get long-term value out of this Sylvanas, which I'm sure she does. Um, so Zelay is relatively confident here that this Sludge Belcher is going to stick to the board mm. at least uh, in some sort of form um, due to the security of being behind the Freezing Trap. Yeah, it's kind of an awkward turn. I mean, she could opt to uh, use the Druidal Claw to proc it yep. and then protect the Shade. It's yeah. uh, definitely a, con a consideration, but two Druidal Claws as well, and that is what she's going to do. Yep, I like this a lot. Uh, cat form, charge, get that busted, back to the hand. Uh, so you now have another charge minion set in your hand that you can use to be aggressive later. It's still 7 mana, so you can combo it still with Savage Roar if you get that eventually and you hit 10 mana. Um, so not too terrible. And yeah, it just allows her to put, protect the value of the minion she has on the board. That Sylvanas was obviously a nightmare for Zalei last turn, just due to how long he took to play his turn, and then how uh, less than perfect what he ended up doing was. So you know this Sylvanas is giving him problems. So from Eloise's perspective, it's, it's no surprise to see her uh, making sure that that continue to stick around a, a high health total and, and continue to terrorize Zalei's options. What do you think of the consideration of wild growth last turn instead of hero powering uh so wild growth would have taken her to nine mana next turn instead of eight uh i mean you start to uh activate the combo bluff i guess that's one thing of deliberately um ramping yourself up to nine mana you, you do get you do pass that message to your opponents like hey i want to have nine mana guess why um because generally scenarios and things like that that used to be in the deck just aren't really seen anymore it's one of yeah. the things that have made room for for the increased early game things like mm -hmm. aspirant and sometimes wild uh living roots so uh, i mean i can see that but 
I see the merit of the hero power as well. It's it's a two health swing, and this is starting to be a game that's uh, becoming a little bit about a race because you're you know, you're threatening to push through ten a turn right now with the uh, with the board that you have developed. So I can see it both ways. So they like, taking a long time over each of these turns. Nothing good can come of pretty much yeah, any I mean, of these options. This is just what Sylvanas does to someone, right? There just aren't good options against Sylvanas unless you have a transform or a silence. Like, how are you supposed to deal with Sylvanas efficiently? It's just not a thing that happens. Well, it just goes with the Doctor Boom, and there is the Savage War. Mm, very interesting. So combos with Druidicon Savage War are available if uh, Eloise just decides to jam face here. Yeah, um, Eloise can guarantee at least stealing a, a 7-2 Dr. Boom here and potentially better depending on how kind the Boom bots are to her. Um, whether they want to they wanna kindly snipe down that Sylvana so we can get the full health 7-7 seven, seven on our side. But I guess Zalei is just in the long term banking on the swing turn of that Unleash the Hounds with the Hunter's Mark to try and uh, fight, fight his way back into this game. Yeah, I mean, if you could get the Dream Boom Bots on the Sylvanas here, that would be a pretty great swing. I'm not sure about the 7-2. I mean, is there merit in just slamming down a Druid of the Claw, even the charged one, and just uh, going all face? And... I think so. I think, yeah, I think even investing the Savage Roar is totally fine here, just because this, this might be as much damage as you ever get from it. It's more than you'll get, well, it's about the same amount as you'll get from it with uh, by buffing the, the Tree Ants, because you're buffing three minions. So the Savage Roar is doing as much here as it ever will. Um, so yeah, I just really like pushing this through, threatening lethal, asking your opponent to have the answer for this, and you just have Druid of the Claw hero power to follow up the next turn to clutch it out. Um, so yeah, really strong line of play from Eloise. Another Innervate hero power for Eloise as well. Not being too precious about the Innervates for uh, playing minions and things like that, just wanting to weave in damage and weave in hero powers. And again, we see a situation... Mm -hmm. Where the hunter has his back against the wall, and it's the druid staring, threatening lethal with the burst. Yeah, very, very strange. It might be that um, things like Darnus's Aspirant and the increased early game in the druid deck are just having a, a stronger effect on this matchup than, than people gave it credit for initially. But honestly, we haven't really seen the druids have, have won the games through things like uh, just getting a strong curve with like Shade of Naxxramas into Keeper of the Grove, etc. It's not like the additional TGT cards have really made a huge difference in these matchups. I think uh, when Zalei won his Druid game, he drew his first Aspirant on turn 9 or something, and I don't think we've seen one from Eloise this game. Um, so it's just kind of the old-fashioned Druid deck that's doing work here against Hunter, which it definitely struggled at, at doing in the past. He's going to put up the King of Beasts now to defend mm. Steal the Boombot. Rocco's face. King of Beasts does come down to taunt. Does he have any attacks left over? Is he atta He's attacked with everything already. So yeah, this is still plenty of damage to push through for Eloise. Delay will know he's dead. He's been paying attention. He knows the Druid of the Claw is frozen in the hand. So Nice try, but no cigar, I'm afraid. Delay goes down two games to one to Eloise. And we are in a situation now where Zalei has just his Fatigue Warrior left. I and mean, we saw him win three games against poor Rainbow God uh, at the end of day two in the group stage, just fatiguing him with the Fatigue Warrior. Probably literally as well as in game. <laughs> uh, a deck that many people have never seen before, but Zalei is up against it with his Druid matchup. Yeah, for sure. Druid is, is one of the decks that, with any type of fatigue deck, you know, you can go all the way through the history of the, the fatigue and mill decks that have been tried, the fatigue mage, mill rogue, you know, all those kinds of decks. Um, Druid is just the scariest deck to allow to see all 30 cards in their deck. Uh, or, you know, definitely one of the scariest, because if you give them access to their entire deck and they can hoard the right cards, you give them access to those really, really stupid double combo turns. Um, which can be amplified even further if you get Emperor down on the right combination of cards. So trying to outlast them when they get to see their entire deck is not a strategy that's easy to set up, but we have seen Zalei succeed in doing it once this tournament already. Well, it doesn't fire War Axe to deal with a potential Darnassus Aspirant, but we see that there's nothing doing in the hand for Eloise right now. She's just going to hero power and pass. As a coin keeper, that is an option she wants to go into, but it's going to be a pretty passive start to this game, I think. It is, yeah. There's uh, going to be a couple of hero power pass turns, but Eloise does already have Emperor and one combo piece. Uh, Firebat suggested during some of the Fatigue Warrior we were casting in, in Zalei's games, uh, I think it was yesterday, 
that, you know, perhaps hoarding combo pieces and just trying to get an Emperor down in almost a Grim Patron-like style <laughs> is, is the right way to play this game as, as the Druid. Uh, so you could see that having a lot of success. It's you know something that occurred to him as we were casting, so it's not something that he tested. But we know how Firebat's brain works. You know, if that, if that lines up in his mind, there's a good chance that it probably does work out. Um, so Emperor and a combo piece, not a bad combination. It's just a shame that Eloise's hand is just extremely slow at the moment. I wanted to ask about the no shield block on turn three from Zelay and just the hero power pass. Is he saving that for shield slam? It's it's a double concern. One, you get to use it for shields uh, with shield slam, but um, by pressing armor uh, or by skipping armor on turn three and using the shield block instead, you essentially over the course of the game gain two less armor because. Um, the hero power, you can only use it once a turn. So if you spend a turn where you don't press armor, you're actually missing out on armor. That armor is gone into the ether that you could have gained that turn. But shield block will always gain you that five, that, that five. So by waiting until turn five when you can do shield block plus armor up, you actually net two more armor over the course of the game. All right. That's why I ask you the question, Sol. You're the expert. I mean, fire that's left us. He's the real expert. I'm just trying to fill <laughs> fill his shoes as best as I can. Um, doing an admirable job. Well, I hope I'm doing a better job than admirable. No, just kidding, buddy. Just kidding. Oh, <laughs> shots fired. I mean, I just get called mini admirable in chat, so I was going to make that joke. Right. Okay. But you've just you zoomed right past me there. Yeah, it's fine. I'm waiting for admirable to now fire a review. So it's fine. I can take it. I'll be fine. Um, so yeah, Dr. Boom comes down, and I think that's actually the first minion we've seen played, uh, apart from the Emperor by Eloise, so she's accelerated all the way into a big gun, she skipped all of that early game nonsense. You can clear this all out by playing Gorhel. You can, yeah. <laughs> that's actually not a terrible looking proposition. It's um, really not. You can also yeah. swing at the face and bouncing blades, but does that allow you to do anything extra with your mana that really makes that worth it? Because uh, Bouncing Blades is a card that's probably going to get decent value against Druid at some point, just because it's good early game removal. Uh, looks like he's going to value keeping the Death Fight. This is something that we saw him do in his previous games. He really likes holding on to that second Death Fight swing as a removal option in itself. And then he's just going to use the Execute. Um, since that's a uh, more situational card, it requires a minion to be damaged. Bouncing Blade just requires there to be one big target on the board that you want to deal with, which is... Uh, Pretty likely situation against a druid who, who likes to just kind of play one or one or two things per turn, and you have the death spite to chop down one big thing, and then the bouncing blade to interact with another. So I like this line from Zalea a lot. All right, lots of options in the hand for Eloise. Reduced cost, ancient of lore, of course, if you want to draw even more cards, but I don't even think she can afford to do that. I think she's too big a hand at this point. So just the shade and the hero power are going to come down. Yeah, this this is a slow start, but as, as we've mentioned, she is hoarding those cards. She does have the Force of Nature and the Savage Roar in her hand now. Unfortunately, she didn't discount enough of the pieces to really tie it together into a huge combo. She had discounted both of those combo pieces um, and have the, the, the original combo for 7 mana. Then obviously drawing into the second Savage Roar lets her do the, the double combo for 10 mana without using the Innovate. Um, so now she's going to have to pick up an Innovate if she wants to unleash the full double combo this turn to, to beat this deck. Um, and that very, very often is the sort of thing you're looking at having to do against how stable this deck is, because it really, really can kill everything you play. Um, often the key is trying to develop two minions at the same time, um, because the, the one for one spot removal from the deck is just too strong. So you kind of want to make the big power spike turns where you, you, you dump a bunch of things in one turn, perhaps using an innovate. Um, and try and get one thing to stick to the board, because you, the, the warrior player doesn't have enough answers to to deal with everything at once. But this sort of situation with just one minion being played at a time, this is fine for the warrior. They can go one for one with the, with their removal options as, as long as you want. Yeah, this is the problem. Like You can't even bank on shredding the armor of the warrior with them using the face all the time. Because yes, they have a lot of win mini a lot of weapons to do removal, but they also have a lot of options as well with things like Bouncing Blade, Shield Slam, Slam, Execute, Revenge, all these options. Right, and they also just have a lot of armor gain through the bashes, the shield maidens, the shield blocks. You know, all of those things are in the deck. So. Um, I do like this. Tempo BGH, even against a control warrior. Um, but if she's been paying attention, she'll know that there's only two high value threats in this deck. There's the Gromash and the, the Baron Geddon from what we've seen. Yeah. Um, so it's not like it's packed full of... Uh, oh, no. Is there an Alex Straza? I imagine there has to be an Alex Straza, right? Sure, but it's not threat heavy. Right, exactly. Um... 
What now? So Tempo BGH is kind of just getting into that situation where uh, there are two threats on the board. You're playing around something like Bouncing Blades. You are asking the, the warrior to come up with two answers per turn instead of one. This is the sort of thing that you need to do consistently if you're actually going to be able to spiral the board and snowball the board and actually build an advantage. Um, if you just spend too much time playing one minion a turn, then you're going to run out of... Uh, you're just, just not going to be able to gather enough tempo. And there's also the concern that she just needed to play a card that turn or otherwise she was going to overdraw. So. We talked about druids behaving like patrons. It's not quite patron levels, but if Eloise can pick up a second Innervate and a second Savage Roar, she has a 26 damage combo with Force of Nature, Double Savage, or Swipe. Seems reasonable. It's uh, about as good as it gets these days, post war song nerf. Yep. So, we are going to see that Bouncing Blades we talked about, like we said, pretty much guaranteed to just snipe down any individual high value threat for the Druid. Takes out the Ancient of Law there, she uses the weapon to crack down the, the BGH. And here we are. Um, Warrior actually ahead on board, gets to develop their, their first high value minion, Sludge Belcher comes into play. And uh, looks like Eloise is considering answering this with the Sylvanas. I have no time for games. It's not, it isn't a terrible answer. It just uh, really threatens. It's it's difficult to remove for the warrior because it's not just a straight removal. You have to think about how it plays out. Yeah, for sure. Not sure if we've seen a silence effect, either a spellbreaker or an owl from uh, Zelay's particular build of fatigue. Lots of people uh, build this deck in, in very slightly different ways. Uh, some people don't use the Bouncing Blades and use other options in there instead. Things like Silence do slide into those slots. Um, so I don't know if there is a Silence effect, but if there isn't, then Sylvanas is definitely one of the most difficult minions for the, the deck to interact with favorably. Yeah, how do you do... I don't think there is any room for a Silence in this deck. Like a Spellbreaker, it's... Wouldn't necessarily be a, a bad deck choice, but I just think from all the removal we've seen, the Death Lord, the Gore Howl, everything we've seen, uh, I'm pretty. I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys saw all of the deck yesterday, right? Uh, we saw a great deal of it because he's not the one fatiguing. He doesn't necessarily draw his whole deck in every game. It's his, impo it's his opponent that's running out of cards. Um, so I don't think we ever saw the complete deck list where he drew all thirty. I might be wrong on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that. There isn't an, uh, a silence in this deck. As you said, the cards that tend to be more flexible and can be replaced with a silence in the Sea Warrior build are things like the Bouncing Blade and the Gore Howl. And we see uh, Zelay playing the full complement of those. So. Well, now that we have a Gromash here, which needs to be answered, there is double swipe op available, as well as something like uh, Swipe Keeper Wrath. Yeah, um, but those are both pretty miserable. It means you spend a turn not developing anything particularly threatening. You give the warrior basically another free turn just to pass by under no real pressure. But as you say, a 10-8 has to be dealt with. It's uh, threatening to hit you for nearly half your health each turn. So there's no way you can really let that thing survive on the board. And you're pretty confident that even trying to wall it out with a taunt like Druid of the Claw isn't going to get you anywhere because the, the deck is so stacked with removal that that Druid of the Claw will probably just... Uh, go down. So it looks like she's going to favor the Force of Nature option because then that lets her use Keeper of the Grove to do the remaining two and at least that way you're developing something onto the board to prevent a threat to your opponent. Yeah, I mean that's what you need to do, right? But there's also potentially double Death Lord to come down now you've played Keeper. Yeah, and he does have the Brawl in his hand, which is this deck's insurance policy against the Death Lord. Um, generally, decks that play Death Lord always also like to have some sort of mass board sweep in case things go horribly wrong with the, the Death Lord's pull from the opponent's deck. So, you know, there's there's the classic priest control priest decks that run Death Lord and back it up with Light Bomb, and we see Warrior doing it here and backing it up with Brawl. And so with the Brawl in hand, developing those Death Lords at some point soon seems pretty likely. Uh, especially now Eloise is starting to develop our own board with multiple minions. Yeah, I mean, this has to be a sign that there is some kind of aggression potentially coming from the Druid. If Sully doesn't play the Death Lords here, I'll be very surprised. Yep. Force of Nature, Savage Roar, Savage Roar is available next turn. So anything that sticks to the board just uh, exponentially buffs the, the potential damage that Eloise has to output. So Double Death Lord certainly seems like a decent protective play. Uh, oh, looks like looks like Zelay's going to hold on to one here. So, okay, 23, 31 damage needs to be dealt this turn. And it needs to be broken up. You know, efficiently, or else he's, they're gonna need, there's going to need to be more than uh, right. 31. 
I'm not sure there's any way to do it, to even do that much damage from hands. No, I don't think there is either. It's, it's a pain. Like, using double Savage Roar actually becomes slightly less efficient to deal eight damage to a Death Lord. With a single Savage Roar, of course, you can do it perfectly with the two fours. And when you turn those fours into sixes, you actually have to end up wasting some damage on the Death Lord, which makes it more difficult as well. I think the maximum amount of damage with the discount that we've got from the Emperor is the 26. It's about right. Um, but Eloise, a little bit out of gas here. She kind of is all in on that, that last push with the, the burst that she has. She doesn't have any sort of minion development. She's going to get one more minion on the board here from the Death Lord. And something like Piloted Shredder would be perfect here. She wants something sticky. She doesn't want anything that can just die to a single yeah. spot removal spell. Ancient of War, not ideal. Only comes out as a 5-5, five five, but still, you're not going to sniff too hard at a 3-5-5 five five on the board. Uh, wild Growth to Cycle as a, as a last-minute decision. Which, uh, you know, you can criticize <laughs> the ordering there, but she had she had concealed information throughout her turn. It's and, second Wild Growth. Yeah. The thing about drawing first is that, you know, you have concealed information. You don't know what card you're going to draw. Um, obviously, she was popping a Death Lord that turn as well, which is also concealed information. So you can't really fault her for the ordering there too much. Second Brawl comes into hand, so we might see the Death Lord being developed here, but Zalei is in that really, really awkward spot where just Druid has just been able to do enough damage throughout the course of the game by playing the mid-range minions. Warrior's done a lot of this damage to himself, honestly, just by doing exactly what he's doing now, trading his face into minions. Um, and now, suddenly, dealing the 17 plus the 8, which is 25. This looks a lot more doable, Callum. Have we got it? Do we have it? We have Living Roots now Ooh, as well. Living Roots That's... has to help, because now you can perfectly efficiently kill the Death Lord using yeah. one 6 damage Triamp from the Double Savage Roar and then Living Roots to deal the last two. So that leaves you 12 like, damage from Yeah, this has to be it. Yeah, that's got to be it, because you've got the Darnassus. Even just with the Darnassus, you don't need to face at all. Yep. Well, yeah, this is going to be a huge burst from the Druid. I mean, this is why we said the Druid was a bad matchup for the Fatigue Warrior, because you can just do uh, a modern-day patron. Yeah, pretty much. That's it. Just forward your damage cards and then try and get Emperor on as many of them as possible. Unleash them all in one turn. Yeah. It's literally just like patron work. But it's exactly the same. Yeah, pretty so, much. Uh, so there you go. Eloise is going to take third place in the HS Arena Invitational. Uh, congratulations to her, commiserations to Zalei, uh, and that's going to be our third place matchup. And we're going to go st look straight ahead to our final no break here. So we're going to go, we're going to run right through. We're just going to get hyped for the final. All right, let's do it. In just a few minutes' time, it's going to be Sixel versus Two Beers. What a story it's been for both of these guys.